get us into YouTube. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. I'm going to provide a short introduction. Um, those of you who are here probably know um, every year in the early part of the semester, fall semester, put out a call for proposals uh, for faculty to present their research, a, a faculty lectureship series. And from those proposals, a committee, members are Dr. Del, Port, Del Porto, Dr. Evanuk, Dr. Starr, Dr. Varela, and Dr. Zhang get together and basically vote who is going to be able to present um, during the year. And we've had some hiccups and things trying to open up and everything. So, uh, but we're today going to listen to uh, one of the finalists that was chosen uh, last fall by that committee, uh, Dr. Bridget Allington. And we're going to basically, hopefully, if the stars align and Sodexo helps us, we're going to have refreshments after his presentation. I told him he should probably keep it under two hours. <laughs> um, I mean, I know he, I, I, I read this, not just the, the synopsis, but the abstract, all right? And the abstract is, it's four very long paragraphs with lots of Latin in it, um, which is interesting for me, but uh, no, it, uh, the, the presentation today is really you know, for all of you. And, and it's basically, he reflects on his research, his scholarship, his interest. Uh, we are basically uh, videotaping this, videoing it for YouTube. Uh, you can tell that I don't really watch YouTube that much, but my grandson does. Um, so basically, this will be the last lectureship this year. And next year, we start the whole cycle again. But I want to thank the committee, committee members. There's one here today um, for their efforts in, in putting this together. And for this one, I also need to, to basically give a shout out to John Hauser, Comp Services, for basically telling me we could put this up on the internet uh, and, and stream it so that people can watch it uh, at their convenience. I think we're going to keep on trying to do that. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't have our own groups here do it because after the presentation of about 30, maybe 40 minutes, um, questions. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of them, questions from you. Um, we're not interactive with the audience, but just questions here. And hopefully, again, if everything aligns, Sodexo will bring the refreshments. Uh, last time we didn't start until 4 o'clock, which had me really worried in the back. Uh, we moved up the time. We're supposed to start at 3.45. Uh, so just to tell you that you can align all this up. Everything gets in there. And uh, thanks to, to Melissa Bros. Academic Affairs to set all this up. Um, you know, it's going to be a great one, I think, because I think it's very interesting. Title: New Soldiers, Crusades of Saint Francis of Assisi. But Dr. Allington uh, started here in 2019, fall 2019, right? Yeah. Seems like quite a while. But he earned his, his PhD at uh, Saint Louis University, and I assume it's in history like this. So. Uh, we're going to be able to benefit from his vast knowledge, his vast experience, and probably some new information that we would like to know about the Crusades because it's kind of a hot topic. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Allington. Thank you, John, and I want to thank the Faculty Lectureship Committee for supporting my proposal, and thank all of you for sacrificing the sun and attending this afternoon. Uh, the work I'd like to share with you today is based on research that I completed for a chapter of my dissertation that I'm just beginning to revisit with the goal of developing it into an article. Since we have limited time together, uh, and since we're an interdisciplinary audience, uh, I'm going to avoid delving into discipline-specific minutiae, but instead I'm going to try and give you an overview of my research, uh, the way it intersects with the state of current scholarship on this topic, and I'm grateful for any suggestions you have as I undertake this process. I look forward to discussing uh, your thoughts in a few minutes. As someone who studies medieval history, I'm frequently aware that the culture that I study is both 
considered extremely foreign to contemporary society, but also a source of enduring fascination. And I even anticipated that John would reference you. Um, <laughs> other, other medievalists uh, have probably noticed this, but whenever you say that you study medieval history or medieval culture, uh, the responses that you get normally are a combination of that's something that we evolved from, uh, that's something uh, that we've come a long way from, uh, we would never live like that. But at the same time, there's an enduring fascination uh, with this culture. Um, we only have to look at shows like Vikings and Game of Thrones to see that uh, modern culture, at the same time as it distances itself from the medieval world, remains uh, fascinated by it. Within this landscape of popular interest in medieval culture, if we look at the field of medieval religion, few topics enjoy the same interest as the Crusades and St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, my suspicion is that if you're talking about medieval religion uh, in a general setting, uh, the only religious topics that possibly come close are the study of the flagellants and the veneration of relics. But if you're talking about medieval religion with someone, the odds are that you're talking about the Crusades or you're talking about Francis of Assisi. And these are topics, medieval topics, of perennial interest, but they typically elicit opposing reactions. Everyone, Catholic, Protestant, conservationist, hipster, even the Pope himself, want to associate themselves in some way with Francis. Conversely, everyone, or at least many people, Catholic, Protestant, European, wish to distance themselves from the Crusades. Yet, we have to remember that both of these phenomena, Francis and the Crusades, were integral and contemporary parts of the same culture and existed side by side and intertwined with one another. And so I would like to present to you how my research that builds on the work of modern scholarship indicates that these two phenomena were far more intertwined and aligned than popular perception tends to acknowledge. Untangling these contested memories reveals a cultural landscape in which the Crusades were far more integrated with everyday medieval spirituality than we might imagine, and in which Francis and his memory were far more integrated within the Crusading movement than is typically recognized. And so I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the Crusades and talking about Crusades historiography. And like I said, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I want to be able to set the context and talk about how understandings of the Crusades have developed and a rough uh, consensus point that they've reached at this point in time. We'll talk about Francis and how he aligns here. The origins of popular perceptions of the Crusades date from the 19th century and from the Romantic movement and in particular from Walter Scott. In 1825, Scott published two novels, The Troth and The Talisman, in which we find Crusaders playing prominent roles. And these novels reflect the influence of 18th century Enlightenment historians and philosophers, such as David Hume and Edward Gibbon, who you see on the top right here. They presented the Crusaders as childish, destructive, uneducated, and superstitious Westerners conducting glamorous but doomed expeditions amid a culture that was far superior to their own. So this is one strand of early crusading historiography. The other strand is a nationalist strand that was pioneered by Joseph Francois Michaud. And Michaud published a history of the Crusades at the same time, 1812 to 1822. And he presented these campaigns as glorious exercises of imperialism and proto-nationalism that reflected the superiority of the French nation writing that the Turks were a type of vulgar barbarians, that the Greeks uh, were more sophisticated but had no will or appetite for heroism, and the Franks uh, were the combination of the two, bravery and honor that gave birth to chivalry in Europe, and this was the story of the Crusades. And so Michaud, in contrast to the novels of Walter Scott, portrayed the Crusades as the first efforts of a chivalric European society to civilize the barbarian lands of the East. And so, as we begin, these two schools of thought seem in many ways opposed, but they were fused together in the 
late 19th and early 20th century by liberal economic historians who were living under the influence and shaped by the age of European colonialism. And so this synthesis gave rise to a neo-imperialist materialistic orthodoxy about the Crusades that in many ways still dominates modern perceptions of the Crusades. And when we think about the time in which these historians were writing, we can see why this synthesis was so popular. These historians had grown up in a society that was dominated by colonialism and religious skepticism. They presented this to follow them to the Middle East in hopes of gaining riches and influence. This interpretation in many ways mirrored the contemporary practice of younger sons leaving the mother country to go to the colonies and gain their fortune. In academic circles, however, this theory began to lose credibility once historians began researching the identity of the First Crusaders in great detail. And these studies were pioneered by a Cambridge historian, Jonathan Riley Smith, who's uh, pictured at the bottom right of the screen here. And in the 1980s, he established that the vast majority of Crusaders were in fact the oldest sons and heirs to the feudal estates of Europe. These studies demonstrated that raising a crusading army was a prohibitively expensive venture for anyone who did not enjoy this degree of wealth and privilege. Consequently, crusade historians recognized that the motives of the crusades were far more typically devotional than material. Most crusade leaders were not seeking riches from crusading, but were willing, in fact, to sacrifice everything in their efforts to restore the Holy Land to Christian control. This new focus on the devotional motivations of the Crusaders has been described as the religious turn of the Crusades. And it's something that is now widely accepted in academic circles, but in many ways has not yet percolated into some areas of popular culture and popular perceptions of the Crusades. Once historians accepted that a significant number of the Crusaders were acting from devotional rather than material motives, they began to attempt to integrate crusading with contemporary pious practices. One popular devotion that seemed especially to reflect the religious observances and attitudes of the Crusaders was the practice of pilgrimage. Medieval men and women often traveled on pilgrimages, especially during the first half of the medieval period before 1100. These pilgrimages were journeys to holy places through which the pilgrims hoped that they might gain spiritual benefits and be renewed in their faith by embracing the difficulties of these journeys, some of which might take months, and by worshiping at the holy places. Pilgrimage destinations were typically considered holy because of the presence of relics of the saints. In Rome, this was the presence of the Christian martyrs. In Compostela, it was the ported relics of St. James the Apostle, and the very soil of Jerusalem and the Holy Land had been made sacred by the presence of Christ and the Apostles. Historians began to view the Crusades through the lens of the practice of pilgrimage, describing crusading campaigns as armed pilgrimages. All the other hallmarks of a pilgrimage were present, the travel, the struggle, and the efforts to reach a holy place. But now the participants were also expected to fight and to use force in order to reach their destination. Historians also recognize that the Crusades were part of a broader trend in medieval religious practice known as the Reform Movement. Now, defining this movement uh, precisely remains a challenge to historians even today, but I think to avoid getting bogged down, it's most effective to think of it in the way we might think of a revival movement in American history. Evil men and women were disappointed by the violence and crime that seemed right in a supposedly Christian society and decided they should attempt to improve their society by encouraging a more conscientious adherence to the spirit and law of the religion. And this medieval reform movement began with the founding of the Abbey of Cluny, which is pictured reconstructed here. And this founding occurred in 910, so we're still almost 200 years before the First Crusade. And this abbey aimed to follow the Benedictine monastic rule with greater consistency and fidelity and inspired many to join this foundation or reform their own religious houses to imitate their observance. So the abbey of Cluny, because of its popularity, is very successful in reforming monastic observance in medieval abbeys. And this success leads to efforts to extend this reform to other areas of society. So we've been successful in reforming the behavior of monks, now we want to move on to reforming the behavior of the nobilities. 
constant raids and feuds of the nobles and knights had contributed greatly to the violence and instability of this society. Beginning at the end of the 10th century and over the course of the 11th century, we find the emergence of a new program called the Peace of God movement, which attempts to establish a Christian code of behavior for knights and warriors, defines non-combatants, prohibits fighting on certain holy seasons, fighting in holy places, all as part of an effort to resist and control the violence of the time. Later, a secondary movement, the Truce of God, emphasized that Christian knights should not fight against other Christians, but should view their role as knights as a call to defend innocent Christians from the persecutions of unbelievers. Knights began to carry relics in their swords, you can see an example of this in the middle picture, and to carve religious inscriptions on their armor and weapons. When Owen II calls the First Crusade in 1095, he does so during using the language of these movements. Christian knights should turn from fighting one another for material gains and instead embrace the hardship of pilgrimage to recover the Holy Land from the control of unbelievers, defend the local Christian populations, and most importantly, to save their own souls. The crusading movement therefore began as part of efforts to extend the medieval church reform movement from monks and priests to knights and nobles. When these warriors took a vow to travel to the Holy Land, they were described as signing themselves with the cross. They would wear the symbol of the cross on their shoulders or chest as a mark of embracing this act of religious devotion and beginning their pilgrimage. The recognition of this development has given rise to the other phrase used by historians to embrace the Crusades, a monastery on the march. Knights could temporarily embrace the spiritual calling of a monk and view the energy of their Christian practice while placing their military talents in the service of the church. So we have the Crusades established as these armed pilgrimages or monasteries on the march as extensions of this reform. Yet the nature of the crusading movement would change significantly after about 100 years following the Battle of Patin, when the crusading movement undergoes what some historians have described as its own religious term. This battle was a disastrous defeat for the armies of the crusaders which led to the loss of most of the Holy Land to Saladin and wiped out almost all the armed forces available to the Crusaders in the Holy Land. In the wake of this disaster, the loss of the Holy City of Jerusalem, the loss of the relic of the Cross of Christ to their infidel opponents, Christian leaders questioned what they had done wrong that God had allowed this catastrophe to occur. And their conclusion was that the society that they represented was still mired in sin. Some reform had certainly been achieved, but God was still displeased with their sinfulness, and they must repent and follow his commands more closely if he was to once again favor their armies with victory. Subsequent popes, most especially Innocent III, attempted to expand the reform movement from the monasteries and the nobles, now to include all medieval Christians. And so, the leaders of the church and of society now encouraged everyone to become participants in the crusading movement through acts of spiritual support for these campaigns, through acts of prayer and acts of fasting, specific days of fasting that were prescribed by the papacy, specific prayers that the popes also instructed uh, Christians to perform. This participation became what a modern higher ed administrator might call a measurable objective in the efforts to expand the reform movement across Christendom. Into this context of efforts to expand the Crusades to those who were not warriors, in support of the reform movement came the poor man of Assisi. And so now we come to uh, Francis, who would have been a child around uh, the time of the Battle of the Team, uh, who is experiencing his famous conversion story in the decades that follow this change. So, with that introduction to the state of the Crusades, at the time of Francis, we turn to Francis himself, and we begin by talking about the different ways that Francis himself has been understood by historians. Much of the focus of modern Franciscan scholarship has been devoted to untangling the historical Francis, Francis the man, from the myths and romanticism that have characterized his early biographies. 
The challenge that's associated with these works is that in their efforts to uncover the true Francis, they risk isolating him from the context in which he lived. The context of the Crusades in particular is one which historians and biographers of Francis have typically either rejected or ignored. The founder, or the man who's considered the founder of Franciscan historiography, is the man depicted here, Paul Sabatier. And he was the first to consciously attempt to discover the human life of Francis that lay behind the hagiographies. Sabatier, as a Protestant living in Catholic France in the early 20th century, was anxious to establish Francis as a proto-Protestant. While he uncovered important sources about the saint, constructed a romanticized image of Francis that was far removed from the medieval culture in which the saint lived. Other English-speaking historians from the same period also have tried to establish Francis as a Protestant before Luther, who was rejected by the intolerant and corrupt church of his day, and even presented Francis as someone who opposed the Crusades as a type of urban pacifist. This school of interpretation is now widely rejected, but there remains a residual reluctance to accept that the man who preached the glories of poverty and humility to both men and birds would have embraced the piety of an intrinsically violent movement. Other scholars, such as Chiara Pugliani, Michael Robson, and Adrian House, have followed and established a consistent pattern of emphasizing distinctions rather than similarities between the Franciscan and Crusading spiritualities. They focused in particular on Francis' famous visit to the Sultan al Kamil, arguing that Francis attempted to achieve through dialogue what the Crusaders were attempting to gain through violence. More recent Franciscan studies, such as those by Brooke and Cunningham, have acknowledged similarities between Franciscan and Crusading piety. But the leading modern biographies of Francis by Bouchers, Manselli, and Thompson, while focusing on understanding Francis as a product of his own cultural environment and stripping away some of the mythical and miraculous aspects of the hagiographical character of Francis, have still eschewed an exploration of the influence of the Crusading movement in shaping Francis' spirituality. I argue that by looking at the early biographies of Francis that were written during the medieval period, perhaps, uh, sorry, in the second half of the 13th century, so in the years, 30 to 50 years after the death of Francis, it's possible to see how these authors drew on aspects of crusading piety to describe sanctity, showing how this movement was shaping the medieval cult of the saints. And so, the key Franciscan sources that I'm going to look at are written, uh, there's a set of biographies that are written by a Franciscan named Thomas of Solano. These were written first in the 1230s, and so these are written in the 1250s and 1260s. And the biographies of Francis by Solano uh, were suppressed for a long time by the Franciscans in the medieval period. They were rediscovered in the 19th century through the work of, uh, of Sabatia. But for a lot of the early modern period, uh, they are not known by those who are working on Francis during this period. So now we're going to move on and we're going to look at some of the ways in which we find uh, crusading spirituality being used to describe Francis. And one of the most concrete ways that we find this in, in the work of Francis' biographers uh, was by the use of scriptural verses that have been used to describe and promote crusading and were still used to describe and promote crusading, now used to describe Francis. So these passages, uh, or the ones that I'm focusing on, are three. Uh, Matthew 16, 24, that you see up here, Galatians 6, 14, that we'll come to in a second, and a third one that is not uh, a quote, but is an image, and that's the image of the tap. Matthew 16, 24 is, throughout the Crusading movement, considered the most important scriptural passage for Crusade preachers. Again and again, we see crusade preachers using this. We see it used uh, in accounts of Urban's very first uh, crusade sermon, preaching the first crusade, and its use remains consistent. So, and I think the connection is pretty obvious. The idea is that crusaders are taking up the symbol of the cross and the sufferings of the cross in order to follow Christ himself uh, to the Holy Land and to Jerusalem. However, this passage is also central to the way Francis and his biographers explain his life and spirituality. And so when we look at the biographies of Francis that were written by Bonaventure, we find Bonaventure using this exact scriptural passage 
to describe France's own calling to his life of poverty. So we have a famous story that most of you are probably familiar with of Francis praying in the church of San Damiano and the crucifix telling him to go and take up this new life of conversion. And when Bonaventure is describing this account, he says that the crucifix uses this quote to tell Francis what to do. This is the life that he's going to live, the life that's described by this passage. Now, we don't find this language used to describe this moment in the biographies of Thomas of Solano. But we find, but the way that Bonaventure biographies are used, they're used in a liturgical context. They're used to be read during liturgies in honor of St. Francis. And it's perhaps the case that Bonaventure saw this quote as the best way of encapsulating this moment in a way that was, uh, in a way that was most succinct. It still shows uh, the use of this crusading scripture to describe Francis' conversion. Thomas of Solano, however, also uses this passage in other places where he describes the life of Francis. And so he uses Matthew 16, 24 to describe the calling of Francis' very first disciple, Bernard of Quintavale. And so Bernard, we read in these accounts, was attracted to the life that Francis was living, was attracted to following Francis, and was trying to understand what God's calling was for him. And so he went with Francis to the church of St. Nicholas in the Piazza del Comune in Assisi, and Francis opened the missal at random on the altar. And the first two times he opened the missal to passages that exhorted Bernard to give his possession to the poor and trust in God for his daily needs, very consistent with the spirituality that Francis is promoting. However, there's a third reading. The third reading is, according to this account, when Francis opens the Bible again, they open it to this passage. And it's only after this passage is read that Francis declares that Christ's manifestation of his way of life to Bernard was complete. And then he exhorts Bernard to go out into Assisi to give away his possessions to the poor and take up the life of the cross, the life of a Franciscan disciple. What's really fascinating about this episode was this practice of opening the Bible at random and pointing to the words and using this as a way to understand God's will for you was something that the church at the time, uh, the hierarchical church at the time, the bishops and the priests uh, and the clergy were trying to end. That they saw this as something as superstitious uh, that Christians needed to move away from. And so what we see here is an intersection of these two movements. On one hand, we see a popular practice that's still in use by Francis and Bernard, at least Thomas and Solano is describing it in this way. And it's intersecting with a movement that is very much a top-down movement, the Crusades that have been promoted by the popes, and they are intersecting in the life and the mission of Francis around the same text that both are using. Francis himself seems to have considered that this passage was an accurate description of his own way of life. So we read in 1209, he journeys to Rome to seek papal approval for his group of followers and their way of life. And we have no direct accounts of this meeting between Francis and the Pope, between Francis and Innocent III. However, shortly after this, the church leaders who Francis is working with to try and get approval for his way of life, they say, you have to come up with a rule. You have to say what rule your followers are going to live by. And we are understanding that Francis doesn't want to do this, that he doesn't want to establish a rule. But they say, you have to do this, and so the rule that he constructs, the first rule, the rule which, which is known as the rule of 1221, opens with this passage. So this is the passage that Francis is using to characterize uh, his way of life. And in the end, this was a rule that the church hierarchy at the time told Francis wasn't good enough, wasn't structured enough. They said, go away and write something, write something with more measurable objectives. And uh, so uh, there was a different rule that formed uh, the basis of the early Franciscan order. But historians have argued that this perhaps more accurately reflects the mind of Francis himself. Shortly after his meeting with Francis, Innocent III calls the Fourth Banner in Council. So five years after he meets with Francis, Actually, he calls the council three years later, and seven years before Francis publishes this rule. And the letter that Innocent uses to call this council is called Quia Maya. And this letter is a call to crusade. 
And this letter not only calls for physical crusading, as we would expect, it also calls for the spiritual crusade, this new form of participation in the crusade that everyone is supposed to be involved in. And in promoting these two forms of crusading, Innocent returns to this same passage. So this passage is being used to promote the crusades, and it's being used to promote France's way of life all at the same time. And so this uh, account, this scripture that's being used to promote the crusades, all the way back to the origins of the crusades, to knights and nobles at Clermont, is now being used to promote the crusading, uh, participation in the crusades to everyone. Another example of the application of this text for the life of Francis we find in the work of Jacques de Vitry. Jacques de Vitry was a famous crusade preacher who was so impressed by the work of the Franciscans that he described them as living out Matthew 16, 24. We know that Jacques de Vitry would have been aware that this text would have been used to preach the crusades. He would have done this hundreds of times in the course of his own career. But for Jacques de Vitry, just as for Innocent and even for Francis himself, the lay reform movement that the Franciscans are carrying out at home and their way of life at home fulfills the highest standards of crusading in the East and represents this broader application of the same spirituality. Second scriptural passage I want to look at is Galatians 6.14. So this is St. Paul's exhortation, glory in nothing except the cross of Christ. This was another text, another scriptural text, that was used to promote crusading. When Innocent III first became Pope in 1198, he called the Fourth Crusade using a sermon that's entitled Post Miserabile. And he uses this text, he encourages the Christians to glory in nothing except the cross of Christ and to embrace this cross, crucify themselves to the world in loving imitation of Christ. Jacques de Vitry, the same preacher, again made use of this passage in his second model sermon for crusade recruitment. And so he emphasized the crusading spirituality of penitential reform wrote that the Crusaders should trust in the power of the cross, not in their forces, not in their armor, but it is only, he said, through the power of the cross that confessed and contrite Crusaders can offer themselves as true martyrs in the service of Christ. And so the way that uh, preaching the Crusaders carried out in practice, not everyone had permission to go out and preach because people might not say the right thing, people might not have uh, the right uh, theology or an accurate theology. And so you had people like Jack de Vitry who were assigned as crusade preachers, and they were assigned to put together a text, a core text that explained the crusade, exp explained the spiritual benefits of the crusade, and this would be given to your rank and file crusade preachers who were expected to take this out and to, uh, and to repeat this language. And they were allowed, you know, a prologue and a conclusion, but the core was expected to be the same to achieve a unified message. So the fact that this is included in a model sermon of Jack of Tree means more than just that one person is using it. It means that this is a widely used crusading text. Again, we are going to find this same text used repeatedly by the early Franciscans. So this text becomes the motto for the Franciscan order, and we have evidence that Francis himself uses it. In what's known as the Fragments text that's preserved in the Cathedral of Worcester, which seems to contain exhortations from Francis himself during the same period from 1209 to 1233, Francis uses this passage to exhort his followers to crucify the vices of their flesh in order to draw closer to Christ. Franciscan's use of this text was the same as that of crusade preachers, namely that Christian renewal was tied to the devotion of taking up a life of suffering in imitation of Christ's crucifixion. Bonaventure, in fact, wrote that Francis exemplified the fulfillment of this verse in his life of self-denial. And we also find that this passage is used repeatedly in the liturgies that were constructed in honor of Francis after he died and was made a saint. And so in the divine office that monks would pray in honor of Francis, in the reading of the epistle that would be read at the Mass of the day, again, this is the text that's chosen and used. This is the text that's considered uh, characteristic of the life and the spirituality of Francis. And so the construction of these liturgies shows how the popes and leaders of the church who were responsible for these movements saw Francis and even that Francis saw himself as living out the piety of the Crusades at home and that the piety of the Franciscans in the Crusades was not in opposition but was in alignment. As evinced by their devotion to these two passages, 
Matthew 16, and uh, the passage from Galatians. Francis and his early companions honored the symbol of the cross as a sign of purity and reform in the service of Christ. And they often convey this spirituality by describing the cross in terms of the Hebrew letter Tau. This letter is said to have represented completion, said to symbolize Christ's victory over evil through the sacrifice of his own life. And the Tau comes to be seen as a symbol of God's protection of medieval Christians. They sometimes mark the heads of loved ones undertaking long or dangerous journeys with the symbol. The Tau has its biblical origins in this passage from Ezekiel 9.4. The idea is that those who are to be saved from God's purge of the wicked at the end of the world will find themselves marked with the symbol of the cross. And uh, we find this also in Revelation. Consequently, for medieval people, the Tau was used as a symbol of the reform movement. Those who had embraced this reform movement would be spared from God's wrath, and it was, of course, appropriated to include the Crusades. We're talking about a group of people who wear the cross as a symbol of their commitment to this movement. Joining the Crusade is considered or described as signing oneself with the cross. In the same period, we again have the example of Innocent III. Innocent III was an enthusiastic proponent of the town as an image of reform. He chose it for the focus of his opening sermon at the Fort Lettering Council, and he chose this passage from Ezekiel as the opening passage for his sermon. And so the theme of this council is going to be penance and renewal through devotion to the cross. But we remember that part of this program, part of this overarching program of reform and purification, is of course the Crusades. And so the Pope exhorts his listeners to be wearers of the Tao in the way they live their lives, to mark those in their care with a symbol. In this way, they would distance themselves from the corruption of the world and purify Christendom and restore it to God's favor. Innocent undoubtedly recognized that crusading, especially spiritual crusading at home, which was included in the Council's program, was a way of putting on the Tao. And Innocent had already described Crusaders as those marked with the Tower of Ezekiel when announcing the departure of the Fourth Crusade. Even before Innocent's pontificate, Henry of Albano, when he was preaching the Third Crusade and exhorting Christian prelates to participate in his acts of prayer and fasting, these acts of spiritual crusading, described those who did so as marking their hearts with the Tower. The Tower was also used as the standard for the Children's Crusade in 1212. And so these preachers are promoting the expansion of crusading as a way for Christians, both on campaign and at home, to adopt lives of reform symbolized by the Tao. Again, we find the Tao as a very important symbol in the life and the biographies of Francis of Assisi. Francis was said to prize the Tao above all other symbols as the symbol of the certainty of salvation. And it became the coat of arms that was used for the order that he founded. He used it himself as his signature. And accounts of miracles that were attributed to him after his death and reported by Bonaventure reported that when Francis healed a man who was paralyzed in the leg, he left behind this symbol on the leg as a sign that it was Francis who had carried out the healing. Bonaventure, though, had already explicitly associated the reform denoted by the symbol with military enterprise. He declared that this symbol showed that Francis was among the militant following of Christ. So the Tower has been used to describe the militancy of the Crusades, but was now applied to popular acts of reform at home, including the spirituality of Francis as described by his biographers. The expansion of the reform movement to include lay penitents fueled by the memory of the early Franciscan saints, was shaped by the scriptural foundations of the Crusades. Descriptions of the lives and spiritualities of these saints employ crusading texts such as Matthew 16 and Galatians 6.14, as well as the scriptural imagery associated with the town. The use of these texts demonstrates the expansion of the Levantine Crusades to popular piety at home. Crusading spirituality was applied to the lives of local holy men and women, who were depicted as taking up the cross to fight against the spiritual enemies of Christ in the same scriptural language as those who left home to defend the Holy Sepulchre. So we talked about uh, the presence of and the finding the cross in the Crusades in the scriptural passages. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, 
two other areas in a little less detail for my group. One area is the area of effective devotion to the cross. So it's already, I think, fairly clear that devotion to the cross is an important part of the spirituality of both of these movements. And it was an important part of the reform movement of the medieval church. This type of devotion to the cross that characterized the reform movement was said to be effective. That is, the worshiper places themselves, or attempts to place themselves, at the foot of the cross and unite themselves with Christ by in some way imagining themselves on the cross and sharing in his human sufferings. So, over here we have uh, two images. The one on the left is actually the image uh, or crucifix that's associated with Francis in Assisi, but it's a significantly earlier image. And so here you see uh, Christ being depicted as triumphing over death. Um, and so it's very much Christ as God and surrounded by the saints. And this is the ultimate uh, victory over sin and death. On the right, we see a later crucifix, which is more contemporary with Francis, which is more reflective of this movement. And here you see the emphasis on Christ as human. So Christ as suffering, the uh, agony of crucifixion as a human being, He's abandoned uh, by all except uh, except the two, and so uh, and in the way the body is depicted, you can see again a focus on the human suffering. And so this was the trend of the medieval period to move from the focus on the left, Christ as God, to focus to the image on the right, Christ as man. And so, of course, we find this in the Crusades: this description of those who joined the Crusades as signed with the cross of Christ, demonstrated that those who became Crusaders marking their bodies with a symbol of the cross as a sign of their commitment to embrace the sufferings associated with the cross and more consciously to follow Christ. And in fact, this is the literal meaning of the Latin word for crusader, Cruce Signatus, sign for the cross. We find this devotion very present in the biographies of Francis. Thomas of Solano linked Francis' first calling to lead a life of pious reform to this personal devotion to the crucified Christ. And so he described Francis' time at San Damiano, where the crucifix spoke to him, as his period of service to the crucified. He recorded that it was at this time that Francis developed a desire to partake more fully the sufferings of his Redeemer. The memory of the Passion was first stamped or branded on the heart of Francis and encapsulated by accounts that speak of Francis being called to this new life by the crucifix itself, speaking to him. Once Francis had received a further conversion to put aside material cares, Francis' adoption of reform was again described using crusading imagery. He was described as enclosing himself in the cross itself and taking up a habit bearing the image of the cross as a sign that Francis had put on the cross to do battle with God. Now, this is really interesting because when we think of popular images of Francis, we think of Francis the holy man wearing the very simple brown uh, garb, and that uh, becomes prominent later on. But it seems very obvious to me that people at the time would have also seen Francis as dressing himself in a manner that looked very similar to the manner of the crusader. The similarities between the language used to describe crusading and the language used to describe uh, Francis' piety are even more apparent in the contemporary accounts of one of Francis' most famous expressions of devotion, the stigmata. Solana records that Francis' reception of the stigmata was an act of being signed with the brilliance of Christ's seal as part of a mystical spiritual experience. Once again, we find this terminology of being sealed with the cross most typically used in this society that everyone would have been aware of to refer to a commitment to joining a crusading campaign now being described to the piety and the life of piety that Francis was choosing to live. And the spirituality of the stigmata was indeed associated with descriptions of crusading piety. So one modern historian, William Fergus, has drawn attention to examples of crusaders receiving the stigmata in accounts of the first crusade. Crusaders who died in a shipwreck on their way to the Holy Land, those whose bodies were recovered after dying in battle with the Saracens, were said to miraculously display the stigmata of the cross on shoulders. Fergus concludes that these men receive the stigmata, or were seen as receiving the stigmata, as a sign of the same devotion to imitating the sufferings of Christ that would later characterize Francis' spirituality. Effective devotion to the cross fueled efforts to reform the church. The Crusades and the 13th century expansion of the crusading movement provided the vehicle to extend this movement from the clergy and the monasteries to the entire church 
and to shape the popular piety. The last area that we're going to talk about is militarism. So Francis' piety is not only described using the same scriptural verses and devotional focus as the Crusaders, but it was itself described as an act of war, now transposed to a spiritual theater. Although sainthood had been described in terms of a spiritual conflict before, the saints that were described in this way were, almost without exception, monks and hermits. The application of the militaristic language and symbols drawn from crusading to the reformed piety of lay saints like Francis demonstrates that the expansion of crusading provided important support for the extension of the reform movement to the laity. Many people are aware, of course, of the famous story of Francis trying to become a knight. And so this statue uh, that's in front of the cathedral in Assisi today is an image uh, that's described in his uh, disappointment of Francis. So it's Francis who leaves as a knight. Uh, he suffers this crisis of confidence. He leaves the army. He returns back to Assisi seeking for uh, a new source of meaning in his life. But what a lot of people forget, or what tends to go overlooked, is that when Francis left to serve as a knight, he left to fight on a crusade. When his father made the famous heavy financial outlay to equip Francis with a horse and armor, he joined the army of Innocent III to fight on a crusading campaign against the enemies of the Papal States in Italy. While Francis was taken sick, and return to a season disillusioned with his first knightly glory, we can see that his life was already linked to the expansion of the Crusades to life at home. Although he had rejected the life of a knight, Francis' new penitential spirituality was still portrayed using the imagery of Christian militarism. Solano described him as returning from his military service with the intention of becoming a knight of Christ. Bonaventure's text uses or recounts a vision that Francis received of a set of arms emblazoned with the insignia of the cross that were promised for him and his soldiers. Now, anyone who's reading this at the time would have known who Bonaventure is alluding to by describing Francis having a dream in which he sees an image of uh, arms and weapons that are signed uh, with the cross, referring to Constantine. And Bonaventure uh, goes a step further and really hammers the point home by describing Francis explicitly as a second Constantine. Thomas of Solano described Francis' work as that of Christ's great soldier. Bonaventure described him as the most vigorous knight of Christ. And in the liturgical texts that were constructed to celebrate Francis, he is described as fortified for battle against the enemies of the cross. So the portrayal of Francis' ministry of reform using this militaristic language as a type of holy war against sin, shows how crusading spirituality was being expanded to support the reform at home and was also influencing that. So now, now we'll conclude. By the time of his canonization, Francis' devotion to the cross was so central to his memory that the Pope at the time sent a relic of the true cross to be placed in the new church that was to be dedicated to his memory in Assisi. This was part of the same relic that the crusaders were charged with defending which had been lost at the Battle of the Team. There is even a story that Honorius III, later Pope, granted an indulgence equal to visiting Jerusalem to pilgrims to uh, the church in Assisi. And so Assisi has become another Jerusalem in the midst of the Papal States, and its saints had become its new crusaders. Francis and his disciples had launched a new crusading front, a spiritual campaign to reform Christendom through effective devotion to the cross of Christ inspired by crusading scriptures, and now extended to lay penitents at home. So, some broader conclusions here. Am I saying that Francis was seen or saw himself as synonymous with a crusader or as a crusader? Not necessarily. What I want to say is that those who were contemporaries or near contemporaries of Francis and who were establishing the cult of Francis and the way Francis would be remembered used the language of the piety of the Crusades to describe his devotions and the scriptural passages they used to characterize his life. I think perhaps the most interesting question is whether they did this consciously. And right now, uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced uh, either way. It could be that they know exactly what they're doing, that they're intentionally aligning Francis with the Crusade. 
it could be that the spirituality of the Crusades and this culture has become such an integral part of this society that subconsciously it's applied to what is considered pious and what is considered heroic. In a sense, that either way doesn't change the fact that the pious ideas that animated and inspired crusading campaigns are now being applied to new areas of medieval society and they are most uh, aptly demonstrated here by the way they are being used to characterize the popular piety of Christianity's most famous lay saint. Thank you. We have some questions. Well, Richard, I'll quiz you on your uh, native country's history. Do you see a correlation between St. Francis and militaristic Christianity and Oliver Cromwell's army? That's, that's a really interesting question. It's, um, it's hard. Uh, I, now, of course, I'm doing this and associating Francis with the Crusades, which is very counterintuitive for most people. It's counterintuitive for me to associate uh, Francis with, uh, with Cromwell, because when we think about Francis, we think of this very um, physical uh, spirituality. Whereas with Puritanism, we think of something that's that's uh, distinct from the birds and, and, and the crusade. I think maybe what's changed by the time we get to Cromwell is um, is that there's already an established idea of what it means to be uh, a holy warrior in, in a Christian context. Um, so this is something that, in some ways, is still under development during this period. But I think by the time we move three or four centuries onwards, uh, this has become so established that it's not um, uh, that, that it's not necessary to refer to someone like Francis specifically. And uh, I think it's it's also the case that when we look at the rhetoric of the Protestant reform, someone like Martin Luther referring to uh, Francis. Uh, it's the same disconnect uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, that Francis is perennially popular with everyone. I don't know about Cromwell, but perhaps, perhaps even Cromwell. And, uh, and so everyone, everyone wants to claim it. And so when we read Luther talking about Francis, Francis is, is the outlier. Uh, and so um, I, guess, I guess that means uh, they would still have appeal to Francis, but uh, there's... I think it's also better to say that there's a reluctance to embrace the medieval church among the, among the Protestant reform. Uh, and more of the drive is to say that this is, this is an aberration and to appeal back to, uh, appeal back to the times of the apostles. And, and this is authentic Christianity that was lost at, and is being recovered. Again. So I, I don't know uh, whether Cromwell appeals to Francis, but it seems less likely. We had a question from the chat. Dr. Gentry was asking, would you say yours is a minority of you among today's historians? What would a critic say about your contribution and how would you respond? So I would say uh, that it is a minority view uh, to associate Francis this closely uh, with the Crusades. So in the recent decades, uh, there have been three modern biographies of Francis that have been produced. Uh, one by Augustine Thompson, one by Arnold, and none of them are, are taking this position. But at the same time, none of them are taking on this issue either. Uh, and so it's, it seems to me uh, that this is, a, this is an issue and, and these are similarities that should be explored uh, and that you can uh, find pretty significant evidence for this crossover once you start looking uh, once you start looking at the primary text. Um, and then the second part of the question was about uh, criticism. It was, would you say yours is a minority view and what would a critic say about your contribution and how would you respond? I think the, the critical argument or the opposing argument is uh, that there is, and this is the area where the research needs to be developed, is that you could say at the end of the day, is the, is the circumstantial. Is this the case that these are common scriptures that everyone is using 
And so that's why they're, they're being applied to Francis. But the people of the time recognize uh, that there's a distinction between the two. Or is there ever a point where Francis says, I am a crusader? Is there ever a point where the text of the, of the time say Francis is the same as the crusader? No. But I, I would say that doesn't mean that the similarities are there. Well, Richard, very serious me, there was a movie back in the 1960s about St. Francis, and then there was a movie in the 70s, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. If you've seen either of those, do either of those come anywhere close to capturing anything about the truth, or are they just pure Hollywood fiction? I, I, I haven't seen the one in the 60s. I, I, I've seen uh, parts of the one in, in the 70s, um, and I, I really like Alec Guinness as, as, as the third. Um, I, I, I think... Um, I think there's a lot in there. So there's the famous scene in, in the movie where Francis comes to the papal court and uh, Innocent is converted by uh, is converted by the, this impression of Francis. And he says he says something like, this is what we should be trying to do. Everyone's kind of laughing at them and then he, he validates them. And there's an aspect of that, that that's, that's very accurate, but I, I think the distinction that needs to be made is that this is, like, it's not a conversion experience for Innocent that happens instantaneously. That's that's the Hollywood expansion. Innocent had been looking for something like this throughout his pontificate. So there's a group uh, called the Waldensians uh, that are outliers in uh, the medieval church around the time of Innocent. And so they're doing a lot of the same things that the Franciscans are doing, this emphasis on poverty and this emphasis on preaching. Um, and, uh, and Innocent works really hard to find a way to incorporate them into the church. So they have been subject to persecution and to uh, efforts to restrict their preaching. And Innocent tries to find them a pathway into, into the church. And it, some of them are reconciled. Some of them at this point have decided that they want to be different. Um, and so Francis is very much an answer to what Innocent was looking for, a movement that was like this, but one that recognized and respected the authority of the popes and the, and the bishops in the church. And this is, a, this is a really important part of the history of Francis uh, that oftentimes, uh, I, I don't know the movie quite well enough, but if there's a way uh, that it's being whitewashed, I would suspect it's to suggest that there's always this antagonistic relationship between Francis and the hierarchy of the medieval church, uh, which, which is by and large not accurate. So I was, it seemed like, and I, you may need to help me out here, but it seemed like your, the sources were about maybe 80 to 100 years from Francis. Uh, a, little, a little more recent than that, so okay. more like 30 to 50. Oh, 30 to 50. Okay, well, that kind of answers my question. I was curious if there was anything closer, because I understood it as, uh, you know, 100 years later or what have you, but that's fairly close to 30 years of those biographical accounts or sure so these these have been written by people who maybe were not there for the events that they were describing but certainly would have known Francis personally. Right. Um, I think when we move uh, further into the 14th century when we move into that 80 to 100 year uh, time frame uh, we see some of the same patterns uh, some of the same patterns again um, what's uh, what's really interesting is a little bit of a tangent uh, is uh, similar sources, uh, biographies that were written to justify canonizing these individuals that relate to Francis' uh, great friend and contemporary Clarence. And these uh, use interestingly similar language. And so one, one of the miracles that's ascribed to Claire is that she resisted an army of, uh, it's described as, as an army of army of Tarsus, or it's, but it's considered uh, to be an army of Muslims who were portrayed or described as attacking the city of Assisi. And Claire comes out and prays, and the army is defeated and, and flees, and this is one of the, the miracles uh, that's used to uh, justify her canonization. But again, I think what we see there 
is this idea of a spiritual participation in, uh, in these conflicts that's extended to another figure within this movement, within this kind of thing. Uh, and those, those sources are actually written a little bit earlier. Um, the Franciscans are um, the order that's in charge of custody of the Holy Land sites. And I'm wondering, is that kind of just a coincidence? Or could there be some relationship there? Right? Because that's, you know, they're, they're going to protect the Crusaders, are going to you know, protect the Holy Sites and get them back. And, and now we, present day, we have the Franciscans, you know, so Good Friday, we take a collection. You know, that's our way of kind of protecting the Holy Land sites today, uh, not, not force of arms. But, uh, and so I'm wondering, do they have a sense of themselves, kind of this relationship? Or is that just kind of a coincidence? Or have you even thought about that? Sure, sure. So um, I, I think the history of the Franciscans and their connection to the Holy Land and the sites of the Holy Land uh, comes from a little bit later than, than, than the time of Francis. Uh, so I think it's in the, the 14th century or even into the 15th century. So we're talking more like 100, 150, 200 years later uh, when this association is developed. But it is true that the reason that it develops is because Francis has this uh, connection to the Holy Land. This is, uh, he, um, he joins uh, one of the Crusades. He attempts to travel to Jerusalem uh, multiple times. Uh, when he hears of two of his followers who have been killed trying to preach the gospel in North Africa, he says, "This is the life truly lived out that, that I'm trying that I'm trying to establish." So, I, I think it's um, not perhaps directly associated with uh, Francis in his lifetime, but I think that association of the Franciscans with those sites is associated with the memory of Francis and the way his attachment to the Holy Land. So you are asking us to take a look at St. Francis uh, with different lens, obviously. And for ordinary uh, Catholics or Christians, maybe, uh, the image of a crusader might be that of a San Ignacio of Loyola. Um, and I'm wondering, since Assisi was such a popular figure, is there any influence there? And if in your work, do you do any, any comparison or do you go about how, as a society, we make these heroes uh, back then? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really great idea. That, that isn't something that I've worked on uh, extensively, um, but that, that would be a really interesting uh, comparison. I think what's interesting about the two uh, is uh, that there are some similarities, but there are also some very real differences. So um, both of them are soldiers uh, early on. So uh, and then both of them stop being soldiers. Uh, but uh, for Francis, the soldiering becomes very much a, a spiritual exercise, uh, as I've been talking here. And for Ignatius, that training is still carried over. So when people think about uh, the Jesuits and they look at the way Ignatius constructs the Jesuits, he constructs them using uh, a military uh, formation and uh, military discipline and military hierarchy. So that's that's the way that he's applying that back then. Uh, whereas France's organization of his community is nothing militaristic about it at all. And, and people at the time probably would have liked it if, if it was a, a little more like that because it crashes and burns uh, into all these fights and controversies immediately after he dies or within within a couple of generations after he dies. Um, so th thank you, that, that's uh, a helpful comparison uh, to, to look at. Um, that's that's the, the best I can do off the top of my head, but it's interesting how there are similarities and differences. I, I know John Montgomery and I are the same age, so he's going to get this reference. The rest of you may not, but there was a TV program called Monty Python, and there's a famous scene where Scottish bagpipers go up in a tower and they throw themselves out to show their devotion. That's actually based on, on a real incident from the Crusades where Muslims went up to a tower and, and threw themselves out to show their devotion. Are you struck by 
the comparison between the religious fervor demonstrated on the, the Christian side and what they were encountering and fighting for the Hawaiian lands? I don't want to say I'm not familiar uh, with uh, with the historical uh, account, so uh, so I can't I can't speak to that. I think the the interesting thing is um, interesting comparison is how it kind of ebbs and flows uh, in in the Muslim response. So uh, Alan can speak to this because we've been talking about it in, in class uh, throughout the throughout the First Crusade and the decades immediately. After the First Crusade, what's shocking to modern uh, students of the Crusades is the lack of a Muslim response. Um, and so the, Muslim, the local Muslim rulers uh, are hopelessly divided and fighting amongst themselves. And many of them are openly relishing the prospect that the Crusaders are going to administer a kicking uh, to the heretics uh, from, from their own belief. And most of them see the Crusaders as <clears throat> more like a superior generation of Byzantine mercenaries who they've been fighting for uh, centuries. And so it's not until 50, 60 years after the success of the First Crusade that you actually see a perception among the Muslim world that, these, uh, that this is even a religious conflict. Um, and um, and then it's, as I say, it adds some close. So then you have this period of intensity, which is probably the period that you're referring to with uh, Saladin, and he speaks about how he would fight fight the whole world in order to bring about an acceptance of Islam. Uh, but then it dies, uh, it dies so quickly once we get into the 13th century, and Saladin becomes forgotten until uh, until the 20th century. And the reason for this is because the Muslims are, in many ways, um, from their perspective, have, have bigger fish to fry. So they're dealing with the invasions of the Mongols, and which are extremely devastating into the Middle East at this time. And you read accounts of, um, you read Muslim accounts of the attacks of the Mongols and the invasions of the Mongols. And uh, the author says something like, you know, Mongols coming in, they're killing everything, killing everyone. And uh, then also during this period, the Franks attacked us, cursed them. And, uh, then, uh, and and that's it, sort of period, game over, and then like back to the Mongols who are really scared. Uh, so what's what's interesting of, and much scared of the Crusade, and so what's interesting about the Muslim response to the Crusade is, is that kind of ebb and flow. Well, let's thank Dr. Adams. <laughs> 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 <laughs>